if you'll be finding your seats. It's about time for us to get started this afternoon. <clears throat> I'm going to apologize in advance for how I sound. I've been fighting uh, a cold for the better part of the last week, and I thought it was starting to get better, and then it didn't uh, a lot yesterday. So I've got a, a stack of cough drops. If I run out of cough drops before I run out of notes, we may be in trouble. Um, so we'll see how that goes. <clears throat> I really thought as coming into this lectureship that this was probably going to be the most controversial topic uh, in the entire lectureship because I know this is an area of debate and uh, we'll talk about how long standing of a debate it's been here in, in just a minute. But yesterday afternoon, I don't know if you were here to notice it or not, but yesterday afternoon, uh, Tom Hamilton stood on this stage and said uh, something about a word being used twice in the Old Testament and proceeded to quote Ruth and Ben Sirach. Now, I'm inclined to just say that was a misspeaking and he wasn't intending to say that Ben Sirach is part of the Old Testament, but if this talk goes really, really badly today, just remember Tom Hamilton said the Apocrypha is canon, so <clears throat> that's far worse than anything I'm going to do. Well, this is, I think, an important topic, and it is one that has been debated for a very long time. Just to kind of put that into a little bit of context, uh, Origen wrote about this very thing in his treatise on prayer, where he said that prayer is to be addressed to no man born of woman, not even to Christ himself, but to the God and Father of all alone, to whom even our Savior himself prayed, as we have recorded above, and to whom he teaches us to pray. There remains then to pray to God the Father of all alone, but not apart from the high priest who was appointed by the father with an oath. And this is something that you see happening a lot in the first centuries. There's uh, an, uh, an essay that I came across uh, just this past year where an author goes through the early uh, church writers talking about uh, how Jesus was perceived of by them in their writings and specifically the issue of prayer comes up. And Origen himself kind of goes back and forth on this, it seems. He says this very clearly, but in another place in his writings, he does pray direct, directly to Jesus. So I'm not quite sure exactly where Origen's stands by the end of his life, but he says this very clearly. And what you th see through those first several centuries is a, a long-standing practice of Christians praying to the Father through the Son. And there's a really good reason why you see that happening. This is something you find talked about in the Bible uh, specifically. You see examples of this very thing. The Hebrews author says in, in chapter 13, now may the God of peace who uh, brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of his eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And now this is the sort of thing, and we'll come back to this later again. But this doesn't necessarily look like a prayer to us. We think of prayer in a uh, second person, uh, us talking to God in the second person, directly to him, the vocative uh, voice as it's called. Uh, and this is not that. This is may God do such and such rather than, oh, our God, please do such and such. But this is a very common form of prayer as well. It's not common in 21st century America, but this is a very common form of prayer. And this is a prayer that God God would do something as a prayer to God who resurrected Jesus through Jesus. And so this is a common form of prayer in the Bible. Jude does something very similar. And this is a doxology. It's a statement of praise to God, which is, again, another way of praying to God. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. And so also Paul in Romans 1, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. And there's a really good reason why we see this practice inside the Bible and outside the Bible, because Jesus says something very similar to this in his farewell discourse to the disciples. In John chapter 15, he says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that in... Uh, and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. And in the next chapter, he says, 
In that day, whatever you ask, uh, in that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. And this fits, although it's not exactly the same thing, it also fits what Jesus says in Matthew 6, right? Where he says, this is how you should pray. Our Father who is in heaven. And there's no through the Son in that particular context, but it is, again, a prayer to the Father, not a prayer to Jesus. And this also makes sense because it fits what other things that we know uh, from the Bible. For example, Jesus is our mediator. Jesus is our intercessor. Jesus is that perfect go-between between between humanity and deity because he's the one being in all of history who has experienced both humanity and deity. And so it fits that we are praying to God through Jesus when you think about it in in that particular context. And also, uh, it raises a question if you're praying to Jesus and Jesus is the mediator, how can he be the one through whom you pray and to whom you pray at the same time? And so a lot of people have thought about it that way and said, well, Jesus can't be the object of our prayer if he is the one through whom we pray. And so you look at the early church practices, you look at practices within scripture itself, you look at what Jesus teaches, you think about some of these things that you know, (coughs) and what is implied from some of these things that you know, and you think, well, case closed, right? This solves the issue entirely. At least you could, you know, if this was all the Bible said about it, I think it might pretty well close the case entirely. But the Bible has a lot more to say about it than just this. And a simplistic conclusion based on a few things is probably not the right path to take. So in addition to showing you examples of people praying to the Father through the Son and thinking about what is taught directly about praying to the Father through the Son and thinking about things that we can infer from truths that we know about the nature of the Son, I also want to spend some time seeing what the Bible tells us about praying to Jesus and what the Bible shows us about praying to Jesus and what the Bible implies about praying to Jesus. Because I think there's a whole lot more there than we may sometimes realize. And so we'll spend the better part of our time looking at a host of other passages that show us another side of this same issue. And we're going to begin with uh, examples of people praying to Jesus in the New Testament. Because there are a lot of them. There are more of them probably than you realize unless you've really gone through this before and looked at it. And so uh, this is a really important place to start. Is this a common New Testament practice? And the answer is yes, it is. It's a very common New Testament practice. One of the first places that you see it within the history of the church is at the death of the very first martyr. You remember Stephen uh, preaching his sermon and the people getting angry and he sees the heavens open and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and he says as much and that's like, that's it for them. They drag him outside the city to stone him. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, to be fair, the word prayer is not used anywhere in these verses. And it may be possible... It may be possible, I almost said something too snarky, so it may be possible to make an argument that uh, this isn't a prayer. If you squint your eyes and tilt your head the right way, I couldn't stop myself. Um, It may be possible to make an argument that this isn't a prayer, but what you have here is a man calling out to his deity in the moment of his death. Now, if I was to give you a multiple choice question where I said, what is it called when a man is calling out to his God in the moment of his death? I'm pretty sure that all of you would come back with the answer. That's a prayer is what that is. That's what Stephen is doing is he's praying. And in fact, this is not just any prayer that Stephen is praying. This is a prayer that is an intentional echo of the prayer that Jesus prayed to the father when he was hanging on the cross. 
Into your hands I commit my spirit. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. What, what Stephen is doing is he's taking the prayer of Jesus to the Father and is in turn praying that very same prayer to the Lord Jesus. This is either blatant idolatry and blasphemy or it unequivocally shows that Jesus is the fitting recipient of Stephen's dying prayer. And there is no in-between. This is not a false dichotomy at all. Either Stephen is sinning in a horrific way, or this is okay. Now, you could say, does that mean that we can pray the same way that Stephen did in that moment? We'll come back to that. But for Stephen, at the very least, there is nothing wrong with him praying to Jesus in this moment. The Bible makes that very clear, I think. There's nothing wrong with him praying to Jesus in this moment. And similarly... In a difficult situation, we find Paul praying to Jesus. You remember Paul had received these great visions. He, he got to see these amazing things. And God wanted to make sure that that did not become a problem for his ego. And so, to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. And so Paul prays to the Lord about this. Why well, you say the Lord, how do we know who that is? Well, there's a couple of things going on here. We'll come back to it in just a second. But the answer is really easy here. And uh, I, I left the answer off the screen uh, because I wanted to be able to ask the question and then answer it. <clears throat> so uh, the answer is in the second half of verse nine. In the second half of verse 9, the Lord is, is clarified. Notice the answer here, my power is made perfect in weakness, is what the Lord says. And in the last half of this verse, Paul goes on to say, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Who is the Lord to whom he prays? Well, the Lord who answers him gives him his power and the power that he receives is the power of Christ. So who is the Lord to whom Paul prays? Well, it's the Lord Jesus is the Lord to whom Paul prays. And again, there's no rebuke of Paul. Paul, you're praying to the wrong person. <laughs> you're not supposed to be praying to me. I'm not supposed to hear this except so that I could turn around and relay it to someone else. Uh, but, you know, this isn't for me. You're doing this wrong. No, it is answered. Maybe not the way Paul wanted it to be answered, but it is answered and Paul is strengthened and Paul comes to understand that this is, in fact, a good thing that it is answered this way. But the prayer is a prayer to the Lord Jesus. And this isn't the only time that Paul prays. And this is one of the things that people say sometimes. And, and again, we'll loop back around to this toward the end. <coughs> But uh, people look at the case of Paul and the case of Stephen and say, well, those are kind of unique circumstances. And I think maybe you can make something of an argument that those are kind of unique circumstances, but that's not the end of the matter. So in 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul says, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he has judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Paul, again, the word prayer isn't used here, but what is it called when we thank our God? That's prayer is what that is. Who is the God that Paul is expressing his thanksgiving to? The, Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so here is a prayer of gratitude, a prayer of thanksgiving to Jesus as Paul begins this letter to Timothy. Another very short prayer of Paul to Jesus comes at the end of 1 Corinthians where Paul in that letter says, our Lord, come. Come. And again, we say, well, that, that's not much of a prayer. It's three words. Shorter than that in Greek is, isn't much of a prayer at all. Well, the fact that it's a short prayer means that it's not a prayer. I mean, how many times have we had that discussion when we're studying through the book of Nehemiah? And Nehemiah prays that, that, that thing that's called the arrow prayer sometimes. That's the one where Artaxerxes says, Nehemiah, what's wrong? And Nehemiah prays and then he answers. Now, I don't know exactly what happened that day, but I know it probably wasn't, hang on, king, I'll be back to you in 30 minutes. I mean, he answered on the spot in the moment. 
And the prayer couldn't have been much more than God give me the words or God give him the heart or maybe both of those, but probably not a whole lot more than that in that moment. And does the fact that it's so short, the scripture doesn't even record it, mean it's not a prayer? I mean, how many times have those of us studying prayer and teaching about prayer saying a short prayer is just as much a prayer as a long prayer is? Sometimes you can speak volumes in just a few words. This is a prayer to the Lord to return. And who is the Lord that is returning? It's the Lord Jesus that is the Lord that's returning. And that's made more specific in another prayer we'll talk about here in just a second. But we've got two more from Paul to talk about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you also. So Paul very frequently prays to the churches to whom he writes. And in this prayer, notice the two that he addresses side by side equally with one another is our God and Father and our Lord Jesus. And this is another one of those prayers that's not in the second person. It's not to you, O our God. It is, uh, again, this less common in our culture, may God do such and such, but it's still a prayer, would have easily been recognized as a prayer. And on top of that, in verse 10, Paul has just said, and this was makes it abundantly clear that this is Paul's prayer for them. Verse 10, he says, this is what I pray for you. And then verses 11 and 12, he prays it. So he has just got done telling them what, what is the content of his prayers. And then we see the content of those prayers in this statement. And so in this prayer, it is a prayer to God and to the Lord Jesus side by side. And he does the same thing in the second letter. Uh, May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, our father, this time he reverses the order who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. And so Paul consistently prays to Jesus through his letters. He does it in his own experience with the thorn in the flesh. He does it in his own experience in in just ongoing prayers. He prays to Jesus to thank him. He prays to Jesus for Jesus to return. He prays to the Father and to the Son on behalf of the Thessalonians on two different occasions. And Paul's not the only apostle that does this. John does it as well. Again, very briefly, come Lord Jesus at the end of the book of Revelation. And so here is that same short prayer that Paul prays. This time it's not Lord generic, it's the Lord Jesus specifically. And uh, for what it's worth, most of the time the word Lord is used in the New Testament, it is referring to Jesus. Where it is clear, where it is specific, it's almost always Jesus and not the Father. Um, There are plenty of times that it is ambiguous, but generally speaking, especially in Paul's writings, the Lord is the Lord Jesus, God is God the Father. Um, And again, we'll look back to that here in a second as well. But not only does Paul specifically and John specifically pray to Jesus, the rest of the apostles do as well. In Acts chapter 1, they have this uh, problem. They have 11 instead of 12, and there's supposed to be 12 of them. And so what do they do? They go to the Lord to determine who the 12th should be. (coughs) You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas has turned aside to go to his own place. Now, again, who is the Lord that they're praying to? Well, again, typically the Lord is Jesus. And so you could say, eh, statistically speaking, odds are that it's Jesus. It's not a great argument, but it's something. Uh, or you could say that, you know, the, the last time, or maybe not the last time, but a very specific time that Luke used this word for choosing, he used it in the context of choosing the 12. And the Lord who chose the 12 was the Lord Jesus. And now they're asking the Lord to choose the 12th. And so you could make a linguistic argument that maybe it's, it's, it's an okay argument. It's still not a great argument, but there's a better argument. And that is back in verse six of Acts chapter one, in this immediate context, when they come together, they asked him, that is Jesus, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? 
And if you get even closer to the context in verse 21, where we're talking about the exact same thing in the exact same moment in the immediate context of this prayer. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. They have identified the Lord in verse 21 as the Lord Jesus. So when they pray to the Lord in the exact same context, it would be stretching credibility to say that it can't be Jesus unless you could prove that there is no other praying to Jesus whatsoever anywhere else in the Bible, in which case maybe you could try to make an argument for that here. But it is abundantly clear that there is prayer to Jesus in the New Testament and the context strongly suggests, if not demands, that that is the Lord that is being prayed to here as well. Two other examples of prayer to Jesus in the Bible that I think is worth our consideration. The first is in Revelation. Now, Revelation, uh, and this isn't the very end of Revelation that we saw a second ago. This is where we're in more of the visions and the symbolism. And, uh, you know, you could maybe make an argument that something different is going on here. But again, I think we have it pretty well established what's going on in the New Testament when it comes to this subject. And so it shouldn't be surprising in Revelation chapter 5, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Notice, again, symbolic language. It's a vision that John is receiving and seeing. But notice what is happening here in whatever symbolic way it's happening, whatever figurative way it's happening, is that these beings are taking the prayers of the saints and they're bringing them and laying them before the Lamb. Who is the lamb, the one standing as though it had been slain? We're talking about Jesus. And what Revelation is showing us is the prayers of the saints being brought to Jesus. And then one other passage uh, that is maybe a little bit surprising for us to say is someone praying to Jesus is back in the Old Testament. Back in the Old Testament, we find a psalm, Psalm 102, that identifies itself as a prayer. Right out of the gate, verse 1 of Psalm 102 identifies itself as a prayer. The historical superscription, that information above the psalm, also identifies it as a prayer. That's probably not original to the psalm, but it, it seconds the psalm's own self-declaration as a prayer. And in this prayer, down in verses 25 through 27, the psalmist says, Of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You change them like a robe, and they will pass away, but you are the same, and your years have no end. And you say, well, that doesn't sound like Jesus at all. It doesn't say Jesus. It doesn't say Lord. It, uh, you know, what's going on here? Well, what's going on here is in Hebrews chapter 1. The author of Hebrews says this, Psalm 102, 25 through 27, by the way, that's about Jesus. And you say, well, that's not really fair there, is it? <laughs> he didn't know he was praying to Jesus. Well, the high priest didn't know that he was prophesying in John chapter 11 either, and that didn't make it any less of a prophecy. The prophets didn't know the things that they were prophesying about and desired to know more about them and didn't understand it, didn't make it any less true. Psalm 102 is a prayer, and Hebrews tells us that it is a prayer to Jesus. Now, what's really striking about all of this that's going on in these New Testament prayers where over and over and over again, you see example after example after example of people praying to Jesus, is that in none of these points does any biblical author bother to argue that we should pray to Jesus. No one ever tries to prove that we ought to pray to Jesus. They just do pray to Jesus. It's not argued, it's assumed. It's taken as a granted in the mind of Paul and in John and the apostles all the way through, no one bothers to try to prove it. They just do it. 
And this is particularly important in the Thessalonian letters, for example, because everybody agrees that these are among the earliest written New Testament documents. This is not something, you know, if Origen is the first person to ever say we should pray to Jesus, then you'd say, okay, <laughs> I don't see that anywhere else. That's a later development. In fact, what you find is Origen says we shouldn't, and the New Testament authors just do. They don't argue, and it goes all the way back to the very beginning. It goes all the way back to Thessalonians, some of the earliest letters written. It goes all the way back to before Pentecost, when the apostles are trying to decide who's going to replace Judas. The practice of praying to Jesus goes all the way back. <coughs> so those are a host of examples of prayer to Jesus. I think you can also make a pretty strong argument uh, from some implications from known truth. Things that we know to be the case, and if we know this to be the case, then it's a natural inference that, you know, such and such else will follow. And one of those implications that's really important is that no one has ever objected to praying to Yahweh, or Jehovah, if you prefer, or the Lord in all capital letters, if you prefer. All that's the same in the Old Testament. It's the name of God. And no one has ever objected to that. In fact, you see that pretty frequently. Moses prays to Yahweh, Hannah prays to Yahweh, David prays to Yahweh, Solomon, Jehoshaphat, Hezekiah, Habakkuk, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezra, and countless psalmists, just to name a few, all pray to Yahweh. And that is significant because the New Testament equates Jesus and Yahweh. And it does it in a variety of different ways. For example, there are a host of Yahweh verses from the Old Testament that are applied to Jesus. We won't go through all of these right now. If you want to snap a picture or jot them down or whatever you want to do, you can look at them on your own. But Isaiah chapter 40, for example, make straight the way for the Lord. What is John the Baptist going around quoting that he's going to do for Jesus? Or you might think of Isaiah 6 that is cited in John 12, the glory of the Lord being seen in Jesus. Or you might think of Psalm 68, the gifts of the Lord, the gifts of Yahweh that Paul sees as being fulfilled in Jesus. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. This is all over the New Testament. Yahweh verses are applied to Jesus. In addition to Yahweh verses being applied to Jesus, Yahweh traits are applied to Jesus. In the Old Testament, Yahweh is the one who gives you rest. He is the one who is your life. He is the one to whom salvation belongs. He is the first and the last. And in the New Testament, Jesus is the one who gives you rest. He is the one who is your life. He is the one to whom salvation belongs. And he is the first and the last. You see, there's this direct correlation between the Old Testament idea of Yahweh God and the New Testament idea of Jesus. <coughs> and if that's not enough, as you look further, you find in the Old Testament that calling on the name of Yahweh brings you salvation. And in the New Testament, calling on the name of the Lord brings you salvation. Now, this might be a little bit tricky because it doesn't say calling on the name of Yahweh. It says calling on the name of the Lord. <coughs> but, <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> but there are two things about that. First of all, very frequently, those are in texts that are explicitly referring back to an Old Testament verse that does say Yahweh. And so there's no doubt that when they apply calling on the name of the Lord to Jesus, it's talking about calling on the name of Yahweh to be saved. And secondly, remember that the Jewish people in the first century refused to say the name of God. They would not say it. What they did instead was say the word for Lord. And this is part of where this practice comes from of Lord being in all caps in our Bibles. Is the word for Lord was substituted for the name of God. And so calling on the name of the Lord is how they would have said calling on the name of Yahweh. And then when you connect that to the explicit citations in places like Romans 10, for example, uh, where calling on the name of the Lord is how you are saved, uh, directly coming from an Old Testament verse that uses Yahweh, it's very clear that this is Yahweh language being applied to Jesus. And finally, along these lines, Jesus is explicitly called Yahweh. And this happens in Philippians chapter 2. 
And this is one of those spots where it's very easy for us to miss it because it doesn't use the word Yahweh. But that is, I am certain what the text is saying. And this comes from an Old Testament background as well. Uh, this, this draws out of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 42, God says that uh, his name is a part of his glory that he will share with no other. In fact, again, the Jews wouldn't even say God's name because it was so high and holy. If you ask any Jew in the first century, what is the most great name that there could possibly be? It's the name of God. There's no doubt about that in any Jew's mind in the first century. But then also notice in Isaiah chapter 45, God says, turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth for I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear allegiance. Does that sound familiar? Remember what, what Paul says in Philippians chapter two about Jesus, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now you've got two options here as you read this verse. One is that the greatest name that there is, the name that is above every name, is Josh, <clears throat> Joshua, the Hebrew version of Jesus. Or the greatest name that there is is the name of God. Now, which one do you think Paul would have said was true? You know, Paul, trained up in the teaching of Gamaliel, rising star of Phariseeism, knows the Old Testament like the back of his hand. Which one do you think he would have said is true? The greatest name that there is, is Jesus, fourth or fifth most common name in the first century Palestine, or that he would say the greatest name that there is is Yahweh. So those are your two options. And then the other pair of options is when he says, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Does he mean Jesus Christ is master or does he mean Jesus Christ is Yahweh? Well, again, the greatest name that there is, is the name of God. The name that Jesus has been given is the name that is above every name. And in fact, Yahweh says to me, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And what do you have in Philippians? Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Paul is not saying Jesus is master here. He's saying Jesus is Lord in all capital letters. Jesus Christ is Yahweh. I think you could make a strong case for that just from Philippians and Isaiah. But if you want to add in the rest of this for background, I think it's undeniable. The New Testament has strongly equated Jesus and Yahweh in a bunch of different ways and here makes it undeniable that every tongue will confess that Jesus is Yahweh. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying that this doesn't mean that the Father is also Yahweh God, but I would suggest that we divide God far more than God divides himself. The Old and New Testament alike repeatedly affirm that God is one and we come dangerously close sometimes to being tritheists rather than being monotheists that believe in a triune God. And I don't know what that means and I can't explain the mechanics of it. So don't ask. But that's what the Bible affirms. <clears throat> God is one. If you're praying to God, you're already praying to Jesus. What about explicit teachings about praying to Jesus? Well, there's really not a lot, not as much as I would like. I mean, as long as you don't count like 15 examples as teaching, there's not as much as I would like, but there's one verse in particular where this is a little bit more explicit. And here in John 14, Jesus says, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Now there are two minor problems with this verse being used as evidence. One is that there is a textual variant. Actually, there's two textual variants. One that says, if you ask anything in my name without an object, and one that says, if you ask the Father anything in my name. 
And without getting into the details of all of this, um, the textual evidence itself, the manuscript evidence, leans pretty strongly in the favor of it being, if you ask me. And then the internal evidence, the scribal tendencies and things like that, <clears throat> also lean pretty strongly in the favor of me being present. A scribe is much more likely to change me to something else than he is to plug me in there when it wasn't there. Especially in the context of John's uh, Jesus' farewell discourse where two other occasions he says, ask the Father in my name. But the other problem here is the oddity of asking him in his name. And this seems weird to us, but this is not a problem because in Psalm 54, save me, O God, by your name, the psalmist says. In the first Chronicles 16, in the Septuagint, this is not in your translations of the Old Testament because it's, it's in the Greek version, not in the Hebrew text. But it would have been what the New Testament authors were reading from very frequently. Give thanks to the Lord, call upon him by his name. And so the idea of praying to him in his name is not something that is without precedent. And so there aren't a lot of direct statements of Jesus saying, pray to me, um, but there are lots of examples. There is equating of Jesus and Yahweh, and I, at the end of the day, I think it's pretty clear. But there are some objections that we need to talk about quickly here before uh, I run out of time here in the next six minutes. So... <clears throat> If it is true that we should be praying to Jesus, why does Jesus teach that we should pray to the Father? Well, because that's good too. That's maybe a little bit of a cop out of an answer, but at the same time, the, the, the point is that one teaching does not exclude the other. There are different good things that we do as Christians. Well, if we're supposed to pray, why does it say we should sing? You see how that works. The Bible can say two different things at the same time and both of those things be true in their own unique way. Some have pointed to Matthew 6, the model prayer, and say, well, look at this. Jesus doesn't pray to the Father here. He says, when you pray, pray like this. Or he says, you should pray to the Father, not you, shouldn't, uh, you should pray to me uh, here in, in, this, in this text. Well, what I'd say to that is Matthew 6 is not exactly designed to be an exhaustive model of how we pray. I mean, if Matthew 6 is telling us everything that there is we could possibly pray about, it's a really short list. I mean, you can't pray about the government. You can't pray about your family. You can't pray about uh, much of anything, really, when you stop and think about it. And if it's not an exhaustive list of the things that we should pray for, I'd suggest it's also not an exhaustive list of the appropriate objects of our prayer, the ones to whom we can pray. I said we come back to this. Uh, some people have argued that, well, these are special circumstances. And to be fair, this is only something I've heard in the context of the examples of, of Paul's thorn in the flesh and Stephen's being stoned. Um, and those are very common ways that people try to argue that we should pray to Jesus. They're great examples of it. Uh, they're very explicit examples of it. But they're also a bit of unique circumstance. I mean, uh, Stephen sees the heavens open. That's not something we're ever going to experience. Paul is seeming to receive a more direct kind of answer from God, which is not something that we experience either. And so, yeah, I do think those are something of unique circumstances. But even if you could argue those out of evidence by them being unique, it does not remove Paul's more general giving of thanks to Jesus, his two prayers to the Father and to the Lord Jesus, John's and Paul's prayers for the Lord to return, the apostles' prayer for direction, the psalmist's prayer that is cited by the author of Hebrews, the general depiction of Christians as those who call on the name of the Lord Jesus for salvation, and the fundamental monotheism held by every biblical author that has ever written anything to say nothing of the Bible equating Jesus and Yahweh, the very Yahweh to whom all believers have always prayed. I've heard people object to praying to Jesus. I've never heard anyone object to praying to the Lord or to Jehovah or to Yahweh. But again, the Bible equates them with one another. And finally, some have said, well, does this mean that we can pray to the, pray to the Holy Spirit too? This is one of the common things I always hear anytime I talk about. So does this mean we can pray to the Holy Spirit? This, my friends, is what is called a red herring. It is an interesting topic to discuss or not. And the biblical evidence or lack thereof about this topic has absolutely nothing to do with what the Bible says about praying to Jesus. It is unrelated 
And so if the Bible said explicitly, no, you cannot pray to the Holy Spirit, nothing to do with whether or not we can pray to Jesus. If it says, yes, you can pray to the Holy Spirit, still nothing to do with whether we can pray to Jesus. It is unrelated to this topic. Peripherally related, maybe, but not directly related. So don't let someone throw you off with this question. It just has nothing to do with anything. I began by <clears throat> mocking Tom, so maybe I should loop back around to him here at the end and point out that very frequently I've heard him say that the fundamental sin that Christians commit, the one sin that every other sin springs forth from is the failure to honor God as God and give thanks. He makes this argument from Romans chapter one, where that is the beginning point of societal degradation. It starts with the failure to honor God as God or give thanks and everything spirals down from there. So that's really the question. Is Jesus God or isn't he? And if he is God and Yahweh God who suffered with us to die for us, how can we not honor him as God or give thanks? And that my good brothers and sisters, is the crux of the matter. The question is not whether we can pray to Jesus. The question is whether we can afford not to. Thank you so much for your kind attention.